one of the things that gave me reassurance about the uh, likely developments of free to choose was the quality and character of the people who were intimately involved in bringing it to birth, starting with Bob Chittister, who was the originating idea, who originated the idea, and was a driving force behind it throughout. But going on, especially at this stage, to Mike Latham, who was the director, who seemed to be ideologically very compatible, and to have a genius for figuring out ways to develop those ideas. Going on to the people at Video Arch, like uh, Anthony J and the others, so that I don't think I ever had any doubts that what would come out would be what my personal view was, and would not be in any way distorted by the people who were doing it. Program five in the series, Created Equal, seems to be separated, in a sense, from the rest in terms of the issue that it deals with. Um, what led you to include that? I don't know. I suppose the fact that uh, the major argument presented by people who are opposed to capitalism and to free markets is that it produces inequality and that egalitarianism is the alternative belief, the alternative set of values that drives most people on the left. So that to leave it out would have been not to face up to the major issue that we were facing. I don't see how you could have done a program like this without dealing with the problem of equality. Certainly agree. Now, however, that program is different from the rest in a very important sense, that in the main, it rests on appealing to principles and ideology and not to facts. There is no evidence, no attempt, if I remember, in that program to introduce any factual data on what's happened to equality, what hasn't happened to equality. The argument is almost entirely philosophical, logical, and ethical. Yes, that was true. Was the series successful, in your judgment? Oh, I think the series was enormously successful. It was successful in the sense that in uh, 1980, when it first appeared, it uh, had a, what was a very large audience for PBS. We got thousands and thousands of letters in response to it, and the number of positive letters outnumbered the number of negative letters by oh, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, I no longer remember how. Uh, we still have, of course, all of those letters in our archives. And I, uh, I, uh, I had, up, into, up to that time, I had always followed the practice of trying to answer personal letters with a personal letter, but I couldn't do it. And so I sent out a form letter to everybody explaining that I couldn't do it. Uh, beyond the immediate thing, I think it undoubtedly played a positive role in the, in the presidential campaign that year. That was a year in which Reagan was running for president, although he won handily at the early stages of the year, it did not look that way at all. He was a, really, an, I think, in a minority. So I think it contributed to that. But much more important, from a longer run point of view, uh, I cannot tell you how many people have come up to me in the course of the year since then or written letters to me saying that free to choose was what changed their views about the appropriate social or organization of the economy. It must be in the hundreds. The free to choose videos have been shown in classes and have been used in many university courses, have served as a source of development. It still goes on today. There is no doubt about it. Uh, I just, within the last week, got a manuscript from somebody who had been stimulated to write the manuscript by, by Free to Choose. So I think there's no question it had a very significant influence. And not only in this country. 
free to choose was shown in in Asia, in Hong Kong, in Singapore. Uh, when we were in China in 1980, uh, this was within uh, a few months after Free to Choose had appeared on TV and had been replayed in Hong Kong. Uh, I was recognized more in the uh, hotel lobbies and so on by people who would come up to me uh, from Hong Kong or Singapore, out, out of out of mainland China, Chinese, who would uh, uh, recognize me because of that program. Similarly, the program has been shown in every country in Europe except France. The, there was a real attempt made by some industrialists to get it shown in France, but, but the French television was very ideological and absolutely refused to show it. Uh, but it was shown in Britain, in Italy, in Sweden, in Norway, it was shown in, uh, uh, well, you name it, you can find it. It's very, Israel, it's very hard, fi hard to find a country where it was not shown. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in countries behind the Iron Curtain at that time, places like Poland, uh, even there, where it wasn't shown, the book, there were uh, underground translations of the book that were circulated. So uh, I feel that there's no question whatsoever that it had a very significant influence and still continues to do so. Why did you do it? Why, what, what motivated you? I really can't answer that question. The opportunity arose. I was asked to do it, and, and I suppose I enjoyed doing it. Mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't say I suppose, I did enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously you got re reinforcements, reactions from people you're talking to. That obviously the reaction of the groups I talked to uh, was very positive. It was a time, of course, as you realize, when there was a lot of uh, uh, discussion and controversy about these matters among students. It was mostly in a collectivist direction. But the interesting thing was, and that's where I got involved, really, was that the aims were individualistic, while the means proposed were socialist. And so I would repeatedly, again and again, before one of these groups say, you and I have exactly the same objectives, but I know how to achieve them and you don't. And that was sort of the theme of my many, many of the talks which I gave to such groups.